Church, I want to invite you to open your Bibles. The Lord is speaking, but he, he has a clear word from us from his word, uh, Luke chapter 17. And um, I don't know if you guys pay attention to preacher jokes, but as a preacher, every now and then you, get a, you hear a preacher joke. And there's a, a preacher joke that's been going around for a long time of uh, this old man that he wouldn't go to church. And his family wanted him to go to church. And they were praying for him to go to church. And they were trying to encourage him to go to church. He would never go to church. He just wouldn't, do, he just wouldn't go to church. And then finally one day he goes to church. And he, he goes to church, and, and he comes home, and, and his family said, what, how's, how's church? Good. What did what, the, preacher, the preacher preach on? Sin. What did what, he, what, he say about sin? He was against it. <laughs> I know that's not funny to most of you, but, you know, for the preacher, it's kind of a funny joke. Well, in, in Luke 17, Jesus, in just four verses, he speaks really clearly about sin, and we see that Jesus is against it. <laughs> and and he, ta- he shows us in these four verses three ways that you and I can relate to sin. And so I want you to see it with me. I'm going to read, and as I read, I want you to see uh, if you can pick out the ways that Jesus is instructing us on how to relate to sin. So Luke chapter 17, follow along as I pick up in verse 1. And he said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come. But woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Well, we see three ways that Jesus is instructing us in this text to relate uh, to him. I'm titling titling the sermon this morning, Make No Friends with Sin. And the first way that Jesus instructs us on how to relate to sin is to protect children from sin. To protect children from sin. Look back at verse 1 with me. And he said to his disciples, temptations to, to sin are sure to come. Let me just pause there and let's just get some definitions kind of right out of the gate here. Sin is any thought, attitude, or action that's opposed to God and his ways. That's what sin is. Sin is any thought, attitude, or action that's opposed to God and his ways. And a temptation is something that would pull us toward, something that would draw us toward, something that would convince us to turn to sin and to turn to... to temptation itself is not a sin. Um, to, be, to, to be tempted is not to commit a sin. Um, But what Jesus is saying is we must protect children. And he says, woe to him. Temptations are going to come, but woe to him through whom temptations come to these to these little ones. I I liken temptation to when I was in high school, I worked on my uncle's used car lot. And um, and I would, among the many things that I did on his car lot, I would drive the cars out to the interstate and back every, like every week. You know, I'd just drive the cars out to the interstate and back and, you know, back downtown, out to the interstate and back and, and back downtown. And one day he said, Freddie T, do you know why you're driving the cars out to the interstate and back? And I said, well, because you told me to drive the cars out to the interstate and back. Yeah, but do you know why I told you to drive the cars out to the interstate and back? And I was like, I, I don't know. And he said, well, so, so they don't smoke when you start them up. So when somebody comes to the car lot and they start the car, well, I'm having you drive it down to the interstate and back so that it doesn't smoke when you start it up. It, in other words, there wasn't a car on the car lot that didn't have a good chance of smoking when it started, and that should tell you how great of cars they were. I mean, these things would roll onto the car lot, and it was just like the worst junked out thing you've ever seen, and the guy that would clean them up, he would take them into the shop and close the door in the morning, and out at about 5 p.m., out comes a car that looked brand spanking new. It just looked pretty, it looked like it had a great wax job, it just looked amazing, right? Well, not only, you know, did it just look good, like we had to drive them to the interstate and back so they didn't smoke, and that's a good picture of temptation. In other words, temptation tries to make sin look good when indeed, just right behind it, it's really on fire, it's really smoking. There's really nothing good about it. In in other words, uh, temptation seeks to like give it a good wax job, make it look shiny, make it look better than it actually is. And we know that that sin, you've probably heard this, sin will always take us further than we ever intended to go. 
And sin will always keep us longer than we ever intended to stay. And friends, listen, sin will always cost us more than we ever intended to pay. And that's why Jesus is saying, protect children from sin. Look at it with me again in verse 1. And he said to the disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come. So when, when you're tempted, it's just going to happen. It's going to happen. But he says, but woe to the one through whom they come. And then, the, and then he says, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. There's something beautiful about children, isn't it? And children aren't innocent of sin. We're all born in sin. We're all born sinners. But there is like a sense in which children have something really special about them that most of us adults are just jaded about. You know what I mean? Like, in other words, Jesus said if we're going to follow him, we must have a childlike faith. Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't say we should have an adult-like faith, you know, a teenager-like faith, right? A senior citizen-like faith. No, he says have a, 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 a childlike faith. In, in other words, there's something special about the season of life that a child is in. There's something special about the little that a child has experienced in life. There's something where a, a child is more likely to trust than us cynical, jaded adults. A child is more likely to, to trust. And, and we know Jesus said, let the little children come to me. And so Jesus is giving a stern warning to his church saying, don't you dare cause these children who are vulnerable and special, don't you dare cause these children to be tempted. We often, um, we often oh, uh, rather underestimate the power of influence that we have. One of the, one of the, one of the values, one of the values in, in the culture that we live in is radical individualism. So, so folks kind of live their life with this, um, I'm not going to let anybody tell me what to do, right? This radical individualism. But Jesus assumes the authority <laughs> in telling us what to do. So he's telling us what to do, and not only is he telling us what to do, he's telling us here that, that our actions and our attitudes and the, the, the way we live our life actually influences others. And he says, woe to you if you negatively influence children to sin. So we, so we like to think, you know what, I'm living my life, and as long as I'm not like physically hurting somebody, whatever I'm doing is just my deal, and it's okay, so don't tell me what to do. But Jesus said, no, 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 it's not your deal. Because whether you like it or not, or whether you know it or not, or whether you're willing to acknowledge it or not, your life is influencing somebody. Our life influence, and we often underestimate the power of our influence. We see it. Six-year-olds influence three-year-olds. Have you ever seen a little brother, you know, and like, you know, a, a little kid's like running around trying to keep up with big brother? He's trying to dress like them and do just exactly, you know what I mean? He's like, where, where do they get that? Influence. There's, there's, there's influence taking place place. Listen, listen, there was probably a teenager here this morning that didn't sing when we were singing because somebody they look up to wasn't singing. The power of influence. And we often like underestimate the power of our own influence, but you see it all the time. And, and what happens, our freshmen in high school are often like drawn into a destructive path because they look up to seniors in high school. And, and seniors in high school are often drawn into a destructive path because they look up to college students. And your grandchildren are open to temptations, perhaps because they watch your life and see you being loose with this or with that. And we underestimate the power of our influence. And, and what we've got to be reminded of is our, our life, our attitude, our actions influence others positively or negatively. And Jesus says, protect the children from sin because they're watching you. They're watching how you live, how you act, how you respond, how you argue, how you, how you fight, how you handle your money, and they're watching. And Jesus said, woe to you. And then he goes on to give us this powerful image. I want to ask you, do you remember growing up and somebody holding you underwater too long? Do you remember how terrifying that felt? Do you remember, like, I remember, I remember, you know, the, the big dudes at the pool would hold me underwater and, like, when I reached, like, my threshold of I can't be underwater any longer, like, I, like fear immediately kicks in. And I'd come up, and I'm, like, coming up swinging and crying and on a bad day cussing, you know, like, you know, and I'm just spitting. Why? Because the, 
the feeling of being held underwater was, was traumatic. It was traumatic. And Jesus is using this image to evoke an emotion in us to say, do you remember what it was like to be underwater? And he says, it would be better for a, a millstone, a giant millstone to be hung around your neck and thrown into the, into the deep part of the sea than for you to lead, lead one of these little ones astray. In other words, your life is not your own. Your life has great influence. Steward your influence to point the little ones to Jesus. In what? In everything. In everything that you do. There, here's an image, a picture of a millstone that was used to grind up the mill. You know, the, the donkey here would just kind of pull it around. It would just grind up the mill. And here's just an image of what it tied around your neck. One commentator described what it would, what it would be like if you're out in a boat. And this thing was tied around your neck. And it went in the water first. And you, like all the, all the slack of the rope, it quickly like gets tied tight. And then, and then your neck, it snaps as you go head first into the water. And so Jesus uses this really provocative image to, to wake us up. And that's, that's why he says, look at, verse, look at verse 1, rather verse 3. He says, pay attention to yourselves. Let's look at it, look at it. Jesus says, pay attention to yourselves. And, and he, says that, but he says that because he knew that most of us would live our life and we would just forget. We would forget that our lives are influencing others around us. We would forget the, the, the power of our own influence to, other, to, to influence what people are doing and thinking and saying. And so he says, pay attention to yourselves. So the first way we relate to sin that we see in our text this morning is that we protect children from sin. But the second way that we see we relate to sin is we rebuke believers of sin. Look at verse 3 with me. He says, pay attention to yourselves. And then he says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. Rebuke him. What does it mean to rebuke somebody? Well, it means that you speak to them about their sin, to expose their sin, to correct their sin. That's what it means to rebuke, is to correct someone's sin. And he says, if your brother sins. So what is, what is he speaking? He's speaking about the family of God. And all throughout Scripture, we see that Jesus, in the, sacred, in, the, in the authors of the sacred Scriptures, they prioritized the care that the family of God would have toward one another. So in the book of Acts, we see that there was none needy among them, because when someone had a need, someone would go and sell something and bring the money and give to those that had need, right? And so the priority was to give to those that had need in the body of Christ. So in the early church... The way the church cared for one another was to be this magnetic draw to the world. In other words, the world was, was to see how the church loved one another, and they were to go, you know what, I'm not sure if I believe what they believe yet, but man, I want to be a part of that family. Do you have a favorite family that's not your family? You just love going to their house because you love the games they play and the way they laugh, the way they cut up with each other, the way they love one another. Do you have a family, like a favorite family that's not your family, and you just want to be at their house all the time? Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, that's what God intends for the family of God to be for the world, right? It's like the world, I'm not, I don't know about Jesus, I'm just not yet sure about God's word, but man, I love that family. The way they care for one another, the way they meet each other's needs. In part, listen, part of caring for one another is speaking the truth to one another in love. Part of caring for one another, part of being a family, is that we would be willing to rebuke one another. This is, this is hard and it's painful. It's, the scripture says it this way in the book of Proverbs, that the wounds of a friend can be trusted. That's why we need the family of God, somebody that knows, I'm not giving up on you, I'm for you, I'm with you, I'm showing up, I'm not flaking out, but I'm showing up in your life, I'm showing up at church, you can count on me, I'm part of this family so that then when you have to say something hard, it can be trusted, and it's a wound, it's a painful. Anytime, anytime you receive a rebuke, it's painful. But the wounds of a friend, the Proverbs say, can be trusted. But don't miss that Jesus is prioritizing that we would rebuke those in the family of God. Believers, Paul wrote it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with the sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters since then you would have to then you, you would have to need to go out of the world makes sense right so he's not saying don't hang out he's not saying don't hang out with unbelievers who who are living in this way because you'd have to go out of the world he says so i'm not saying don't associate with the world but he says but now i'm writing to you not to associate with anyone 
who bears the name of brother, there's that family again, so someone that professes to be part of the family of God. Don't hang out with them if he is guilty of sexual morality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So don't go to the ball game with them and don't go out to eat with them and don't enjoy hanging out with them if they claim to be a believer, but they're living in, listen, unrepentant sin. And so by, by God's design, by God's design, there should be a, a, a removal of fellowship from, from a believer who's living in unrepentant sin, and by God's design, that removal of fellowship is to be used by the Spirit to wake them up, to, to put them back on the right pathway. But, but look at what else he says. For what do I have to do with judging outsiders? This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. What do I have? The Apostle Paul. Who am I to judge outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? <laughs> You know, 20 years ago, the most famous verse in the Bible was John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It seems like, it seems like the most popular verse today is judge not, lest you be judged, right? But here Paul is saying, is, saying it as clearly as he could say is in the church you're to judge one another. Now what does that mean and what does that not mean? Well, it doesn't mean that you're to have a spirit of judgment and a spirit of condemnation. And if that's the way you're to relate to one another in the church, that's not what Paul means. What he does mean, listen, what he does mean is that we are to make objectable, or rather, objective observations about people's behavior. Objective observations about people's behavior that are believers. And then love them enough to speak the truth to them because sin is always lead you down a destructive path. Do you see it? So here's the beauty of a, a, a mature church is when we love each other enough that we're willing to engage in the awkward conversation because the wounds of a friend, a rebuke is painful, so we're willing to endure something painful on behalf of a brother or sister in Christ in order to help them to see the destructive pathway that they're walking in. Do you see that? Do you see that? Now, some of us this morning are really good at rebuking, and we kind of like doing it. <laughs> and you kind of just need to chill out a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Like, go easy. You're inflicting pain on everybody. Um, I mean, some of us this morning, we'd say, we're terrible at rebuking. We hate conflict. We avoid it at every opportunity we can. We just run from it, and we need to be emboldened by the Spirit of God to love people enough that we're willing to speak to them about a destructive attitude or action in their life. Does that make sense, church? Um, but don't miss this. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul writes it this way. He says, brothers, again, you see the priority of what? Family there. So the priority, it doesn't mean that we don't have a prophetic message for the world. It doesn't mean that we, we don't ever say anything prophetic to the world. But, but our message to the world is an invitation of grace, right? You're, <laughs> you're condemned by the law in your flesh. But Jesus wants to set you free from this condemnation. So step into grace. That's the invitation to the world, right? Yes. But within the body of Christ, we've already been freed from the condemnation of the law and the flesh. We're already freed to walk in obedience. So now we just need people to love us well enough to say, hey, you've been freed for that. Why, why are you walking in that? Jesus has already freed you from that. He says, brothers, if any of you is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, that's every Christian that has the Spirit of God living in them, you are spiritual, if you're a believer, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of what? Gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So, never, ever rebuke someone through what, written text. In an email, in a letter, in a text message. Don't do it. Because most people don't read written text <laughs> in the most gentle way. And God's instructing us that if we're going to restore a brother, we need to do it in gentleness. Listen, 86% of communication is nonverbal. So what that means is, is the expression on our face and our body language and the tone in which we say it is communicating far more than what we're actually saying. In other words, you could say something that, like, you could just kind of get your words, like, you could get your words all jumbled up. And you could almost say, like, the wrong thing. 
But if you say it in the right way, you're communicating something really important. So you communicate gentleness in your, in your tone, in the way that you say it, in the look on your face. In other words, when you're telling a brother or sister in Christ about a sin in their life, you're to do it with such a gentleness that they, they can see the pain that it's causing you on your face when you're telling them about it. So in other words, if you take great delight in rebuking someone, you're doing it wrong. It should be painful to tell somebody about their, their sin. Because, why? Because you love them and you know it's going to be painful for them to hear it. So you do it in gentleness so that they can see your face, so that they can hear the tone of your voice. You don't write it and you, you share it um, in, in, that, in that way. And the, and the beauty of it is it's, the aim is restoration. The aim is, the aim is restoration. One of, one of our elders last Sunday gave me a really, a really, really, really soft rebuke, but it was so gentle that I just like wanted to give him a hug afterwards. It was just like, would you rebuke me again in that way? Because I just felt your love, you know? It's just like so good. And that's what we can experience as the family of, of God. Really, really beautiful. So we protect children from sin and we rebuke believers of, of sin. And then finally, we, we forgive repentant sinners. We forgive repentant sinners. We forgive repentant sinners. Look at verse 3. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Listen, every Christian, every follower of Jesus needs to be able to define repentance. If someone asks you this morning, can you define repentance? You need to be able to say, yes, I can define repentance. And so here's the definition of repentance. It's to turn. It's to turn. So Christian repentance is to turn away from sin and to turn to Jesus. So what is Christian repentance? To turn away from, say it with me, turn away from sin and to turn to Jesus. Every Christian needs to be able to define what it means to repent. All right? It was Jesus' first sermon. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So what does it mean to repent? It means to turn from sin to turn to Jesus. So if someone turns from their sin and they turn to Jesus, you should what? Forgive them. How many times? Every time. That's what Jesus is getting at. Look at this. Look at this. And if he, and if he sins against you, verse 4, and if he sins against you seven times in the day, <laughs> some of you are like, that's my boss. Thank you very much. He's not a Christian and he's not repenting, but he's sinning against me seven times a day. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must what? Forgive him. Why? Why? Because this is the way God treats us. <laughs> this, is the way God, this is the way God treats us. In, in, other, in other words, why should we withhold forgiveness from somebody that sins and repents and sins and repents and sins and repents? Why should we withhold forgiveness if God doesn't withhold forgiveness from us? Listen, dear friends, listen to me. You'll never turn from your sin and turn to Jesus and him not forgive you. He'll forgive you every single time. And that's the way we are to conduct ourselves in this church, in our family, in our marriage, in the kingdom of God. We're to be a completely different counterculture, right? Because what does the world do? The world, I mean, if you sin against me once, strike one. You sin against me twice, strike two. And most people don't even get to strike two, right? And you sin against me three. You know, but, you know, you see, look, you see this, <laughs> you see this all over social media, right? And it's just so, like, against the teachings of Jesus. But it's like, if somebody is toxic in your world, canceled. Right? I mean, some of you probably posted that on social media this week, right? Like, right? You know, like, find the people that are for you, and those are the people in your circle. And Jesus said, love your enemies. And forgive the person that sins against you seven times. It, and, and so, like, the, the world is just like, no, 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 no. Just, just, build a, just build a painless, rebukeless, like, everybody thinks you're God cocoon around you. I mean, that's the way of the world, right? If anybody hurts you, canceled. If anybody sins against you, canceled, right? This is the way the world is thinking. And the church is like, no, 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 no. You keep sinning against me, and I ain't leaving real life. You keep sinning against me, and I ain't leaving my community group. You keep sinning against me, and I'm forgiving you because I keep sinning against him, and he keeps forgiving me, right? Do you see it? It's really not that complex, is it? It's just really, really difficult to live. Not that difficult to understand, really difficult to put into practice. Right on? 
So here's the good, here's the good news, is his grace is sufficient for us in our time of need, church. The Lord wants to meet you in this moment, and he wants to supply you with all the grace that you need to give to that believer in Christ that sins against you, right? I'm not, listen, I hope, I hope you know and hear my heart this morning. If you're in an abusive relationship, you need to get out, period, okay? If you're in an abusive relationship, you need to get out, period. That's not what I'm talking about, all right? I'm, I'm ta- but, I'm, but I'm talking about a heart of forgiveness toward our brothers and sisters in Christ when they hurt us, and it's going to happen. Listen, the more intimate the relationship is, the more pain you're going to experience in the relationship. Did you hear that? The more intimate the relationship is, the more pain you're going to experience in the relationship. So you can live a pain-free life and have surface-level relationships for the rest of your life. Or you can dig in deep and experience the great joy of being family in the body of Christ. And you're going to be hurt And then through the grace of Jesus, you have the supply to forgive repentant sinners. Do you see it, church? Let's pray together, and let's ask for his grace and his mercy. Just with your head bowed and your eyes closed, maybe there's somebody here this morning that you heard the good news that you actually can be forgiven by God. And maybe you just have been sitting under the weight of your guilt and shame, and when you heard that, something something lit up in your spirit this morning, and, and you thought, if I can be forgiven, I want to be forgiven. You believe that Jesus died in your place. You believe he rose from the dead. And and if that's you this morning, you don't know that you're forgiven of your sins, but you want to be forgiven, I just want to invite you to pray a prayer, something like this, quietly, silently, in your own heart. Dear God, I've sinned against you, and I need you to save me. Dear God, I've sinned against you, and I need you to forgive me. Dear God, I've gone my own way, but I want to repent and turn to you. I've been the king of my own life, but I want you to be the king of my life. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. If you're here this morning and you prayed that for the first time, asking God to forgive you of your sins, would you just look up at me and raise your hand high so I can see you? Nobody's looking around, but I want to celebrate with you. I see you on the back row. I'm celebrating with you. Sister of God, listen. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Heaven is your home. The Holy Spirit is now in you. Forgiveness is yours. Welcome to the family of God, sister. I see you, sister. I see you. Did you hear those great promises? Forgiven of all your sin, that burden is no longer yours to bear. Jesus bore that for you. Welcome to the family of God. Freedom is yours. Freedom from guilt and shame. Jesus is now your brother, he's your savior, God is your father, and heaven is your future home. We celebrate with you. Anybody else raising your hand saying, today I'm receiving that gift of forgiveness. I need Jesus to save me, I can't save myself. Anybody else, if you're worshiping with us online and, and, you, and you see your need for forgiveness and you want to trust Jesus today, would you just leave a comment, I'm trusting Jesus today. We'll follow up with you and celebrate what God is doing in your heart. Listen, if you've trusted Jesus today, you need to be baptized. That's the first step. You need to be baptized. We can do that next week. So just take out a card, fill it out and say, I've received Jesus and I want to be baptized. Do that today. Church, if you're like me, you're like, man, I need God's grace to empower me to forgive people because it's hard is hard. So God, would you give us the grace that we need to extend to other people? Let us be a let us be a, a beautiful bride for you, Lord Jesus. Let us be a beautiful bride. We pray in Jesus name. And all God's people said, "Amen." Let's stand to our feet. Let's sing out church.